I'm not hitting the right buttons. <laughs> Try to fix my hair. Hey, Pastor Tyson. Hey, Dre. How y'all doing tonight? I'm good. How about you? Hi. I'm good. I'm good. How's Ashley? I can't hear you, baby. You on mute. Oh, she's fighting. She's fighting. She's still fighting. Okay. Good. All right, well tell her I asked about her. I'm praying for her. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Did you hear the story about the blood plasma today? Either of you? Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. No. Um, let me see what station I was looking at. I think I was looking at um Channel 4. Try to see if you can go on their website. It's about uh, Charles Drew and they're going to implement um, the blood plasma as a solution. So it's very interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll check that out after Bible study. Yeah. Hey, Mama, Mama Woods. Hey, baby. How are you? Good. Hey, Mama. Hey, daughter. How's my Ashley? She's fighting. She's she's home fighting. She's home fighting. Yep. Yes, ma'am. You fighting with her? Yes. Okay. You being that strength for her? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm praying. Thank you. No problem. That's what mamas do. Yep. <laughs> love you. Love you too. All right, let her know I love her. I will. Okay. The the doctor's name at Howard University is Dr. Hugh Mighty. That's working. Wrong test. That's I'm work- Mother Woods. How are you? I'm good, darling. How are you? I'm doing well. That's hey, Les. Hey. Dre, how's it going? Good. Good. 
Hello, Pastor Tyson. Hello. How are you? Hi, everybody oh. on the phone. I'm well. How are you? Good. Let us sneeze. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, Overseer. Hey. Hi, Overseer. Hey. hey. I guess I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. I don't I think, I don't know. So let's pray. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah. God, now we ask that you will forgive us for all of us. Yes, Lord, forgive us for all of our sins that we have committed knowingly and not knowingly, oh God. Oh God, today we come corporately, hallelujah, Raman de Besoria, asking for your power, God, Anandaya, so, asking for your glory, so, asking for your anointing, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God, today, as we come in, hallelujah, to learn of you, oh God, I pray that you will begin to open up our ear gates, hallelujah, you will begin to open up, hallelujah, our learning. Yes, Lord, in the name of you, that we may begin to, hallelujah, understand and comprehend everything that's being released on tonight, oh God. Oh God, I pray even for the teacher tonight, God, shift her into a different hallelujah dimension in you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I cultivate the teacher in her now. I command the gift to begin to stir. In the mighty name of Jesus, oh God, shift her. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. Shanda Bansoya. Yes, Lord, shift her now into another place in you, oh God, in the name of you, oh God, oh God, I even pray for the minds of the people on tonight, oh God, I thank you for Citadel Khadijah, a prayer, oh God, hallelujah, I thank you for their strength, oh God, hallelujah, I thank you for their strength, oh God, and I thank you that they know that, hallelujah, you will not leave them nor forsake them, oh God, I thank you for provision, in the name of you, oh God, for your people, I thank you for provision, oh God, for your people, I thank you for provision, oh God, for your people in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Yes, Lord, the God that can do all things but fail. The God, hallelujah, that heals bodies. Hallelujah. The God, hallelujah, the Andibiosha that's still known as today, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that will provide. And we thank you in a mighty name, which is I dare somebody to say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I miss you all. Hallelujah. I believe Pastor Amen. Murphy. amen. Glory to God, hallelujah, is um, teaching tonight. Hallelujah, I'm excited. I did. I was not on um, last, what was it, last Tuesday um, because I had to get another blood transfusion. Hallelujah, but we're declaring, declaring that that is the last one. I'm feeling better. Hallelujah, I'm excited. I miss y'all. I miss the church. Lord, I'm ready for fellowship again. So, Pastor Merville, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this thing over to you. One of the God flow, how God tell you to flow. Teach, I'm excited. I got my notepad right here ready. Love you. Love you, too. I miss all of y'all as well. It's good to see everybody's faces. I mean, it's different on screen than it is being in person. And y'all know I like the hug. So, I miss my hugs. And... Apostle, I'm just going to warn you that when they do say that we all can fellowship again, I'm getting mine. So tonight, you know, we all are in the series of understanding Holy Spirit. And I have been studying since I got the assignment and I was like, whoa, okay. And I messaged Apostle and I told him, I said, Please pray that I get through this because as a bride and most of us that are married and all of us that have been in relationships understand and know that when you are married to someone, there is a different relationship that you have with that person. And that there are times where the, that person and Holy Spirit is a person, can take over. So, y'all pray for me and with me. I have been studying Spurgeon, Tory, and Miles Monroe. And each one of the teachings are totally different. I really did not get into Pullman as of yet, however, the information and the studies that I currently have now is just so overwhelming. I probably won't get through everything because as a teacher, you have to lay the foundation and you have to give the history and the background and 
obtain an understanding of what it is that you are releasing. As a teacher, you have to be able to break it down so that no matter the age, everyone can understand it with an understanding of a four-year-old. That's a lot of how I minister. That's a lot about how I teach. I go through the history. I go through the who, what, when, where, and how, and the why, 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 why. I continually ask why, 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 why. I will be coming from several scriptures. The first scripture, and we all know this, and this, the, the, the subject is understanding the person, the power, and the purpose of Holy Spirit. As I said, Holy Spirit is a person that comes with power to bring forth a purpose. Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom of heaven. What do I mean by governor? All states have governors that were elected. And these governors were elected so that they can put principles, policies, rules, plans, and purposes in place for the state in which they are elected to. The kingdom of heaven is not like a state. It is the kingdom. And in order for God to establish his kingdom here on earth, he had to find somewhere to place it. So John 14, 14, and I'm using the good news well, I mixed the good news and I mixed the King James. John 14, 14, John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father and he shall give you another helper, which is a comforter. In the King James, it says comforter, who will stay with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So what is he saying? When Jesus left, he said, I will not leave you alone. I'm going to leave with you someone to take my place that will continually be with you and in you so that you, as children of the Most High are able to and can be able to continue in the principles and the practices of the kingdom of heaven. There are seven qualities of Holy Spirit. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of God. I'm going to stop right there. And you say A them, lot of times, excuse me? Can you say them one more time? Wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of God. And you said these are what? Seven qualities of Holy Spirit. Okay. That's only six. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, One, knowledge, two, three, and the fear four, of God. Five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, excuse me. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Okay, I forgot one. I apologize. I'll get it and make sure you get it. Okay. The fear of God does not mean that you are scared of God. Fear in this context means that you have a level of respect that you don't want to disappoint. As parents, a lot of parents get to a place where they want their children to fear them, but they want them to fear them and be scared of them. That in itself is not a good practice to have. I never wanted my children to be scared of me. I want my ch children to respect me in a manner that they won't disrespect me, disobey me, or disappoint me, as well as themselves. When your children are scared of you, then it's not much that you can get out of them. I've seen households where the children don't, I'm, I'm scared to talk to my mother, I'm scared to talk to my father, I'm scared to do this and I'm scared to do that. That's not fear. In the contents in which Holy Spirit is talking, fear is a level of respect that you will not do what God does not require you to do or you are willing to do whatever it is not to disappoint God and not to bring shame upon yourself. First Corinthians 2, 10 through 16 says, but it was to us that God made his secrets by means of his spirit. In the word it says that we are to dwell in the secret place of the most high. The secret place of God is a place where you and he commune as one. That's the place where you receive counsel. That's the place where we, in commune with Holy Spirit, can get to God. Holy Spirit reveals the knowledge of God to us. Holy Spirit reveals the secret things of God to us. We all know the scripture that God reveals his things to the prophet. However, the prophet can't speak or be the mouthpiece of God without having relationship with God through Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you know how you hear people say, I heard this little voice told me, or I heard and in my mind, I heard such and such a thing and it told me not to do it after you have already done what you were already counseled on not what to do, what not to do. I attribute that to the voice of God through Holy Spirit. When you get to that place where you know, as the Bible says, his sheep know his voice and another voice he will not follow. God will always reveal the right and the wrong to you through Holy Spirit. But you have to have relationship with Holy Spirit. You have to be in counsel with Holy Spirit. You have to be married to Holy Spirit, hence the bride of Christ. We're not married to God, we're married to Christ. And I taught on this some time ago. So as his bride, Ryan, you will do anything that you can to ensure that Kevin is always pleased and happy. So it is with God. If we are obeying, if we are following, if we are adhering to the voice of Holy Spirit, if we are in constant commune with Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit is our lead and our guide, 
then we're not going to move out of his way. We're not going to say, if Kevin says, Ryan, I want chicken for dinner. And you like, oh, shut up. I'm going to fix fish. You wouldn't do that. So why would we do, if Holy Spirit says, go right and not go left. It's like, uh, if I go left, I can get there quicker. But he knows all things before they happen. He knows what we don't know. So instead of going right, you continue to go left, and what, boom, you're in a, a bunch of traffic. Why? Because you did not obey the voice of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person. I got a lot of notes here, y'all, excuse me. He has a purpose, and he has power. Are you raising your hand? I was, but I was letting you finish. Okay. Go, you can finish what you were saying. Holy Spirit has a purpose. Holy Spirit has power. Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom of heaven. The role and the purpose of the governor of a kingdom as I stated, is to establish the rules, the regulations of that kingdom. In politics, the governor is the ruler, the chief, the leader, the head, the manager, and the overseer. Cars have governors. In your car, you have a governor. The governor in your car regulates all the supplies, your air, your gas, et cetera, and so forth. It ensures that your car runs with uniform motion so that you don't have any problems, mechanical problems or issues. If your governor goes out your car's day, it's is junk. Which is why you have to continually keep your maintenance up on your car. Same with Holy Spirit. If you don't have a relationship with Holy Spirit, how can you do the things that you need to do that God has called you to do? If you don't have relationship with Holy Spirit, if you're not seeking guidance and direction from Holy Spirit, how can you survive? How can you do what you have been called to do? If a prayer doesn't have relationship with Holy Spirit, she cannot effectively run the media ministry, the cameras, take pictures, because she has to listen to what Holy Spirit says. She can't take just any old kind of picture. If we posted pictures of people chewing gum and talking and on their phone texting and everything, because that's what a prayer wanted to post, or that's the picture that a prayer wanted to take, that's not her following the leading and the guiding of Holy Spirit. He is no longer her governor. She is operating on her own. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back to you were uh, talking about how um, you used me for an example, and you said um, like a bride. Like if my husband said that he wanted uh, chicken, I wouldn't just go and cook fish. Um, I think that even with relationship, um, I think a lot of times we as believers, our perception of the Holy Spirit is what is what causes us to mishandle him um like for exactly example, if you get into a situation and i know for speaking for myself um everybody know i have a mouth and i'm very opinionated and if i get into a debate or a disagreement with somebody i can know for sure that the holy spirit is saying ryan don't say that ryan don't do that ryan don't post that ryan don't type that and because um 
my perception of the Holy Spirit hasn't always been um, correct. I've heard people say, even for myself, why I turn him off or I sit him to the side or I'll say, oh, Holy Spirit, hold on for a second. Um, I'm going to say what I got to say and then I'm going to acknowledge you. And that comes from um, you use me as a wife, even with being a wife. Um, I can be married and, and love my husband, but if my perception is not right of him, um, if I don't see him as the king of my home, um, no matter what he says, I won't honor it. Exactly. Or, or mm -hmm. I'll take what he say and I'll sit it to the side or his voice will become second when nothing goes on in my home without the okay of my husband first. You see what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. So and you, um, have, you, you really have jumped way ahead because that's, that I'm coming to that point. Oh, sorry. Oh. It's okay. It's sorry. okay. That's okay. That's okay. Because that is one of the things, one of the areas that we have to acknowledge the fact that, okay, God said he's going to send a comforter, which is Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and it all goes back to relationship. Yeah. When you receive Christ, because it's three parts. It's triunity. The Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one. You can't have one without the other. I taught a lesson to when I was teaching for youth, for, for the youth, um, youth church many, many years ago. And I had to teach on triunity. And I'm like, okay, God, how am I going to get these children? And I had the 10th through 12th grade. And I'm like, okay, you know, God, you know how they be thinking. So how am I going to get them to understand exactly what it means to accept all three parts, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit? And I'm driving in my car, and I'm like, okay, and I got to teach this lesson. You got to help me, you know, because the lesson is, I got to teach this lesson in a couple of hours. So God, you really got to let me know. Holy Spirit, come on, pour something down, let me the first thing that came uh, that I heard, all right, the first thing I, that came out of his mouth was a chicken wing. That's exactly the face that I made. I'm like, a chicken wing? He was like, yeah. He said, first of all, they're going to understand the concept of food. Everybody eats chicken wing. I'm like, okay, so break this down to me. All right? We all know about the battle between the flats and the drums. You got flat, flat people that only like flats. You got people that only like drums. But you don't hear about the tip. It's three parts to a chicken wing. You got the flat, the drum, and the tip. I eat all three parts. I I just like, you know, it's meat in all of them. However, let's say the drum is God, the flat is Christ, and the tip is Holy Spirit. Chickens don't leave the air, but they flap their wings. How are you going to flap? How can the, the, your wings flap if you look at any bird? They, are, they have all three parts. How can you fly without a tip? How do you fly without a tip? You don't. So if you, if you have religions that only, only know God, only accept God, you have some that only step, know and, and speak on Jesus. And then you have some that believe in all three. Citadel, we believe in the entire triunity. We believe the Father, we believe the Son, and we believe Holy Spirit. Because we know with one without the other does not make a full triunity. We cannot be limited 
God could not come down from heaven. He sent his son. His son could not stay. So he left a comforter. One, we, one without the other negates the entire package. A pencil, a pencil has three parts. It has the eraser, it has the covering, and it has the lead. If there's no lead in the pencil, how can you write? If there's no eraser, how do you re remove your mistakes? If you don't have the, the shell, what do you have to hold? It's useless. So your belief, you, your belief of one and not the other negates the entire principle. Apostle, you have something to say? Yes, let me try to explain this a little um, better for people um, so that people can understand. The Holy Spirit is, is, the, is the, equals the fullness of the Godhead. Um, she used a good example, the pencil, the eraser, and the, um, and the lead in the pencil. It is a pencil, but it is one. It is one God, I mean, it is one pencil. God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are one. I'm muting your phone, Colette, unless you had a question. God, Jesus, and Holy God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are one. It is, it is the Godhead. Does everybody understand that? So when I'm talking about Holy Spirit, I'm not negating the fact that He's not God or that he's not the presence of Jesus because he, they're still one, which is why he is a person and can be offended. Ryan made a good point because she said um, her perception of Holy Spirit would make her feel as though she can ignore him or she can turn him on and turn him off. Your perception is what matters. If you are, if you're living up, and I said, said this Sunday, it is impossible to live as if there is no eternity after this. But guess why? Because Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth, which is why he can be grieved when we ignore what he's saying or we don't do what he says to do or we decide to do our own thing. I um, mean, I'm not going to get too far in this because we have other people that are teaching these aspects of him. Um, but I wanted to bring a little clarity on that so that everybody can understand that we're not talking about three different beings. We're talking about one. All right. Go ahead. You're doing good. I'm enjoying this. All right. First Corinthians 2, 10 through 16. It was to us that God made known his secret by means of his spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the hidden depths of God's purpose. It is only our own spirit within us that knows all about us. In the same way, only God's spirit knows all about God. So it's in essence, it's saying, you know you. You know your ins, your outs, your likes and your dislikes and what you will do, what you won't do, how much you'll tolerate. Ho same with Holy Spirit. He knows God. He knows everything there is to know about God because he is God. Verse 12 says, we have not received this world's spirit Instead, we have received the spirit sent by God so that we may know all that God has given us. God sent Holy Spirit to us so that we can know him. 
So how can you know somebody without getting to know somebody? If you don't have relationship with Holy Spirit, if you don't get to know Holy Spirit, because you can't know God other than through his word, but the only way for you to become personal and intimate is to have a personal and intimate relationship with Holy Spirit. That's how you become one with Christ, through his spirit. Christ is not here. We didn't live in a day where he walked the earth, but he left someone to teach us and show us and lead us and guide us and govern our lives so that we can understand the principles, the word, the basics of God and become more like God so that we can become little gods here in earth, on earth. Why? Because God not coming down from heaven. So he, ne he needed to create a domain for him to dwell. And that domain is us. so that he has the ability to show himself through you to others. Mm -hmm. If you're not portraying the life of Christ, if you're not living according to the word of God, then why is it that someone would want to follow you? And I know many of us have heard why I'm going to be a Christian. Y'all act more worldly than the, than the world. <laughs> Most of y'all got more hell in y'all in than the hell that's in the world. Why would I want to be a part of something that's not going to change me? But that's, that's, that's the, the world that we live in. The Holy Spirit has come so that we don't have to live, we don't have to look like heathens. We don't have to look like hypocrites. We don't have to sound like hypocrites. We don't have to be hypocritical in our actions and the way that we portray God to other people. But he has given us the ability to become new creations in him so that those that look on us can see the Christ that's in us and want to be changed. Mm -hmm. Amen, Pastor Jackie. Holy Spirit eradicates heathenism. Uh, that's good. Let me write that down. Christ is... I have a question. Yes. If that's the case, why do you feel we are at a place where we just do anything? Um, if it eradicates heathenism, and if, it, if it's what... If it's what um, if it's what governs us, why do you think there is so much disobedience to him? Um, and when I say disobedience, I mean in a lot of areas as being Christians, like we are backbiters, we are liars, we are cheaters, we are, um, we are a lot. And in most cases, those areas of our lives take the longest to shift. If, if I'm making sense. You're uh, making sense. Why do you think that is? If I may use, because, like I said, I studied Spurgeon, Tory, and Monroe. Miles Monroe actually touched on that in his teaching. Because we don't understand who we are and who dwells with us. 
we don't understand the person of Holy Spirit and that we can be changed. We haven't come into the relationship and the understanding, the wisdom and the knowledge of Christ to say, okay, I don't have to be like this, but I can become who I am supposed to be in Christ and still be likable. I believe that a lot of people who want to live a life of holiness believe that they're not going to be liked because so many stigmas and so many words are attached to holiness. To be holy doesn't mean that you're stuck up. To be holy doesn't mean that you're better than the next person. It truly means that I decided to be all that I know I can be and become. Not just because I think I'm better than anybody. None of us are any better than the next person. Most of us have come to the the knowledge and the understanding that I can be so much more. I can be so much greater because I am dedicating my life to God, to Christ, and living the fullness of Holy Spirit within me so that I can become. And yes, I ended become because there is so much to God said that if you keep your mind on me, I will give you, I'll give you, I'm going to give it to you. As parents, if, even if you have animals, if you have a favorite sister, a favorite brother, a favorite of, there are people that are in our lives that we will do anything for. We will give them anything they ask for. That's the way it is with God. He's, you're my child. You're from my kingdom. You are the princess and the queens that I have placed here. Why would I not, why would I not give you everything that I said I was going to give you? He said, you are a royal priesthood. We got a hand. You are a holy nation. You are a, whole, a peculiar person. So if we are the princes and the queens and the kings of this earth, of this domain, if God gave us dominion over the earth, why would he not give you the tools needed to glean everything that's in it from him. We got a hand that's raised. I have one too. Okay, whose hand is raised? Pastor Tyson. Yes, Pastor Tyson. I, I was just gonna make a comment that um, before my mother got to the place where she is now, I can remember when I first became a Christian, she began to uh, do what the scripture said, and she probably didn't even know what she was doing. She was confessing, where it tells you confess your faults one to another. Yes. And she began to start confessing to me um, the, the things, I, I mean, just stuff that was just really almost uh, very difficult. It was very difficult for me to listen to. But what she was describing to me was the trauma that she had experienced all of her life. And so I thought it was very interesting that she was sharing these things. And basically what she was, what she was saying was, how do you come out of this? Now, I don't know if I ever really got a chance to answer her questions because I think that I was just coming into the knowledge of God myself. And I, I said all of that to say that uh, I think sometimes we, we are, are 
we're too judgmental and we're too quick and and we think it's you know this instant it, it's a process it's going to take a while and and the things that she was describing you know um it, it would take a tremendous amount of uh, dedication on the Christian's part to overcome it. And so once she began to share these things, I found that it helped me in my deliverance because I'm like, wow, if you went through all of this, now I understand uh, why you were interacting with your children the way you were. So... Uh, the Holy Spirit is definitely uh, the person that can help you to overcome whatever it is in life, but I don't think the church always communicates that properly. Um, and I can remember really looking, and I've shared this with Apostle before. I mean, I looked. You told me somebody was looking for some answers. I was looking for some answers and um, I went through a lot of days of disappointment because I wasn't finding them. And so I don't know, um, some of it's denomination, you know, that has some, some to do with it. And, and I don't want to take up a lot of time because we could go on forever, but perhaps uh, um, Elder, you and I can talk about this at another, uh, another time. But I just wanted to share that, that I saw her trying. She was trying to come out of that. And she didn't understand how to do that. And she had this, um, uh, I could tell she had basically an introduction to uh, God, but nobody taught her about deliverance. She didn't know anything about that. She didn't have a concept of it at all. But she uh, faithfully was this person going to sing in the choir and attending Bible study because that's what they taught her to do that. But deliverance is something different. And um, it really shouldn't be that way, but I'm, you have to really look for it. And I had to look and I had to go to several different churches to find it. So all these things that we criticize people about their sin, um, some people really want to get rid of it, but they're not really getting the answers about how do people a lot of times just tell you just stop. Well, you know, all of it doesn't just, it doesn't quite work that way. And so I, I just thought I would mention that it, it's a process. It took a while before I could say that I had overcome in many different areas. And, and today I'm still doing some overcoming. I'm not there. You know, people give you these titles. I fought for the longest. I didn't want no pastoral title because I'm like, look, I don't think I'm ready. But I think if I told God that one more time, I might not be here talking about it. <laughs> so I thought I'd share it. Thank you. I have a comment. Okay. I have a comment. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit or piggyback a little bit about the question that Apostle, that Bishop had just asked. Um, so he asked a question. So like he said that in that, in that sense, how come, you know, so many of us, you know, do the things that we do and we continue doing it. I'm not sure that's what exactly, that's the way he said it. Yes, that's but, what he meant. Oh, okay, right. And then why is it that, you know, they continue to keep doing it over and over and over. So, and this is really from my own personal experience. Um, I truly believe that, um, especially in the life of a Christian. And I do believe that the reason why that I believe um, some of us have so much hard time with trying to understand the Holy Spirit or doing the things that we do um, my own experience, I do believe that it's because we do not, some of us, we do not have, you know, a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit and to even get to understand who he is in our lives, what his purpose or his functions are, because he has so much functions in our life. And so because some of us, we are, you know, we are really, we are ignorant of, you know, some of, of the purpose, his main purpose in our lives as a Christian. Um, we find ourselves to have 
no conviction because there's no relationship. Um, so when you do have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, a deep relationship, whereby you have to actually seek him, for, seek him, you have to want him for him to be able to reveal himself to you. You will not begin to understand, you will not begin to help you um, to let you know that he is your guide. He will let you know that he is your, he is, you are his comfort or he is your comfort. And that, you know, if you do have any issues, you could always call upon him and he will guide you. He will lead you. But if we do not have as a Christian that deep relationship with him to actually get to find out ourselves who he is and try to cultivate that life in, in our Christian life, we will just find ourselves to do all type of crazy things. Because as we do those crazy things, we never come to repentance or conviction because we do not have that strong presence of the Holy Spirit that can actually convict us, you know, to break you down. As my own personal experience, I've had this several times whereby I will do something wrong. And, you know, and after doing what I have done, and after just sitting for a while, I will have a conviction whereby I will completely just break in tears. You know, I will start to find myself crying. And then he will not remind me because he's my, he's, he's the one who reminds us of everything. He will not remind me of what I have done. So in that moment, I have already received the conviction. He has broken me down because now I have broke down in tears. So I truly believe that the reason why, you know, some of us do the things that we do or, you know, we behave the way we do is because we do not cultivate the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life to really build that relationship with him, to know why he is in the life of a Christian, because his, his, his work is so vast and you have to actually want him, invite him into your life in order for him to begin to manifest those things inside of your life. Amen. Okay. Um, I got the seventh one, Apostle. Okay. Holy Spirit carries the Spirit of God. Okay. Okay. I stopped at verse 12. We have not received the world spirit. Instead, we have received the spirit sent by God so that we may know all that God has given us. 13. So then we do not speak in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. As we explain spiritual truth to those who have the spirit, whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from God's spirit. Such a person really does not understand them and they seem to be nonsense. Meaning if you don't have the spirit of God, if you don't have relationship with Holy Spirit, if you are not in direct communion with Holy Spirit, it's going to seem like Greek when you hear stuff. It's going to be like, wait, what does that mean? What is that? Huh? Have you ever heard somebody speak to you in Spanish? Somebody speak to you in another language? You'd be like, what? Because you're not Spanish. And many of us have not learned how to speak in Spanish. I was married for 20 years. I still can't speak Creole. I can speak French, but I cannot speak Creole. My, my ex was, was Haitian. And every conversation that he had outside of me was in Creole. I picked up on some words so I knew when he was talking about me. And you know, most of us women got that eyes like, okay, what? And he, he knew that I understood that much. But it's the same with Holy Spirit. God speaks to you. And if you don't have relationship, if you have not developed a covenant and a communication with Holy Spirit, where you can understand what God is saying through Holy Spirit, 
you gotta be in the dark. You gotta be like, what, 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 what God are you saying? Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying. Such a person really does not understand them and they seem to be nonsense because their value can be judged only on a spiritual basis. Whoever has the spirit, however, is able to judge the value of everything. But, conjunction, no one is able to judge him. Verse 16, as the scripture says, who knows the mind of the Lord? Who is able to give him advice? What's we, however, what have the mind of Christ. So, so who, can, who, who can judge God? Who can understand God? Those that have the mind of Christ, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What scripture was that you just read? That was 2 Corinthians 2, 16. Okay. We have to understand the most important person on this earth is not Trump, is not Hogan, it's not you, and it's not I. The most important person on this earth is Holy Spirit. Why? Because he knows the mind of God, the mind of Christ. He knows all things. He knows things that we will never know. Why? Because he is God. He was, Christ was sent to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. He came, if you go to Matthews 4, 17, he came to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. His opening speech was, repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. As his kings and queens here in earth, on earth, we were placed here to rule our, this territory, our domain, with authority and power. How can we rule with authority and power except we be empowered by Holy Spirit? We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the things that God has established for us to do. He gave us everything we need. He gave us, he said, okay, I give you dominion over and he goes on to list everything that he has given you dominion over. But you can't have dominion, you can't rule unless you're empowered. How do you become empowered? Through the person of Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How do you get to know the person of Holy Spirit? Through communing. You said that the, uh, let me make sure. You said Jesus Christ was sent to establish the kingdom of heaven and the earth. After Christ ascended, what do you feel? And this can be <clears throat> not just her, but anybody else can answer to you. What did the Holy Spirit um, come to do? Holy Spirit came to establish the same powers and principles that Christ had 
to us. How though? Christ came to empower them in the earth. Christ was sent to establish the kingdom of heaven in the earth. What yes. was what did the Holy Spirit come to establish? The he came to establish the government or the governing power of God to us. Where at? In us. That's it. That's what I was waiting for. Sorry, I, I left the part out. In us. Right. Christ came to establish the kingdom, kingdom of heaven in the earth. The Holy Spirit was established so that we will understand that everything Christ established is already in us. The kingdom of heaven is in us. So whatever we manifest is because it came from us, came from the inside of us. Exactly. And, and and keeping up with that, the kingdom Christ came to bring the kingdom of heaven, to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The kingdom of heaven in earth is a government, not a religion, but a government. And governments are ruled by governors we are holy spirit is the governor that lives in us or supposed to live in us which helps us to establish kingdom principles here in this earth realm I have a good scripture for that. I have a scripture, but go ahead. Which one do you have? Isaiah 9, 6. I have Romans 14, 7. It says, for the kingdom of God is not meat, is not matter of eating or drinking, which is tangible, but is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so I know I don't have much time. You got 10 minutes. Okay, so what I learned in my studies is, and I was like, wow, really? Is that true? Okay. The USA, the United States of America, is a territory. The states within the 50, what is it, 52 states now, are actually countries. Which means, and they, they, they come together to build one territory, which is the United States of America. And all 52 states are the countries of America. I know, it, I'm like, okay, I gotta dig deeper into that. Now, each one of us in God's kingdom, in his territory, are countries. We each speak a different language. Although we all speak English as our native language, however, our heavenly language, unless you, I'm, I don't want to say it, but unless you are mimicking someone else's tongue, you have your own heavenly language. We each have our own heavenly language. Now, in this establishment, you can tell a person's territory and who that person is 
governed by by the words that they speak. Yes. Which brings me, um, uh, you just made a very valid point. Here, my question is, is there a language? Is there a language of the kingdom that move, that shifts outside of our language of tongues? Because I think we get hung up on the speaking in tongues, tongues aspect. My question is, and this can, this can be a group question too, um, is there a language of the kingdom? And if so, what is the language? I don't have an answer, but I can get it for you. Anybody else want to answer that? Because there is a heavenly, a, a heavenly language, which goes beyond our tongue. Because, and what I what I have what I have found is, although we all speak in tongues, there is something that there is a language that precedes the surface. Because a lot of us only speak surface tongues. Why? Because we don't go in depth. We don't go into the deep parts of Holy Spirit. We don't go into the deep hearts. Deep cries unto deep. So you must go deeper into God to understand and get to the language that he is actually speaking. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Um, I guess my question is, does it, that, does it actually, is it actually a language or is it is, is it a matter of everyone being unified give, and, and coming forth with that one sound? Would sound be a language? Um, right. I, See, I would say to a degree, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's kind of hard because, I mean, you have to... It's a... I don't know. Don't think I don't I'm know. trying to make this hard. I'm not. Hey, 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 I say no, 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 no. But I mean, I mean, it's, 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 go ahead. I think, it, Mona, Rona, I think it will be, I think it will be considered a, a sound can be a language depending on what sound you're lifting up. If we're lifting up a sound of victory, the language will be victory because we lift up a sound of victory. If we're lifting up a sound of war, that will be the language war because our sound will be war, right? Okay, Elder Burgess, you were saying makes sense to me. Well, I know it says in the Bible when you have nothing to say, you moan and groan, and he understands your moaning and your groaning. I mean, you don't when when you're not trying to let the devil know what you're saying. Moaning and groaning and humming, he understands what you're saying. So, and that's a, and that's a language because he understand it. It can be considered a language. Mm -hmm. Um, what I was gonna say was, if um, I know there is, there there are certain things that can be languages. For example, like Apostle says, a sound different sounds mean different things would then would equal out to a certain language but there's also dimensions in the spirit because it um it's not just a surface level of receiving the holy ghost and speaking in tongues. exactly however there are different dimensions so the deeper you go i believe that your language do shift based on where you are and the level that you are for example um if I'm praying and I'm just praying and I'm, I'm just so to get strength, it'll be different. When I shift into a deeper level and you begin to pray concerning a certain thing, based on what that thing is, your language will shift. When you, when, even when your spirit shifts into a different dimension in God and you go into a deeper level and you begin to walk in a deeper place, your language shifts. So is there languages? Yes, which would equal out to different dimensions. But then 
it would equal out to the different place that you are and what is happening at the moment. Is there a healing language? Perhaps. Is there a, um, a worship language? Perhaps. So heaven, I believe that heaven has many different languages, one of which is, is worship, one of which is, you know, is praise, one of which, you know, can, can be determined different things. Um, but there's definitely different levels. Okay, I see some other people that want to say something, but let me try to uh, try to try to allow you guys to understand the question more. There is a kingdom language okay. that, that I'm referring to that goes beyond our language of tongues, that goes beyond our language in, uh, in intercession. There is a kingdom language once we're Holy Ghost filled. What is the kingdom language is what I'm asking. Does that make a little more sense? Pastor Alice, I see you unmuted. Ryan, you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, to like the first, the first question. When everyone was speaking of different languages, I actually had a question um, in reference to like um, Elder Wildeen spoke on a healing language. Can't that be tears? Doesn't he understand your silent tears? He, can that be a language? He does understand that. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's answers are uh, are correct in on a certain aspect. I'm not looking for that. For that. Yeah. Okay. So to this, yeah, point, I, I, the answer. There is one language that is really understood in the kingdom of heaven. And that is your faith. Right. Okay. Here's what I wrote. English is not a dominating language in the kingdom. Spanish is not the dominating language in the kingdom. God only responds to one thing, and that is faith. The dominating language in the kingdom of God is faith. Without faith, we cannot move mountains. We cannot please. Without him. faith as the size of a mustard seed, we cannot get answers. So what is the language of the kingdom? The language of the kingdom, the kingdom is faith. Even when we're praying as the spirit gives us utterance, faith is what shifts us because even when we don't understand what we're praying for, the Holy Spirit does understand what we, what we prayed for. And he responds because of our faith. Mm -hmm. Everybody got it? Yes. Faith transcends cultures, ethnicities, and nationalities. When we learn the language faith, communicating with the Holy Spirit would be extremely simple. The faith language has nothing to do with what you say. It has everything to do with what you believe. The mm -hmm. faith language is not about speaking positive words. It is not about being optimistic. It is not about thinking good thoughts. The faith language is about what you solely believe. And when you, but when you have a belief system in faith, everything that you declare out of your mouth is faith. Which is why even when we see things turning out for their bad, we have the faith to believe that God is going to work it out for our good. That's the language. Oh, Paul, Megan. Oh, I'm sorry. Pastor Jackie and then Megan and then we. I need to close this up because I don't want to get chewed out for being over. There's a disadvantage of using this technology and even though you think that every word came across clearly, there was something you said there but it kind of got chopped up. Uh, I got sort of the gist of what you said but I lost something. Which part? Uh, it, it was a word that he used preceding beliefs. I said the faith, faith language has nothing to do with what you say. It has everything to do with what you believe. Okay, I got that part. Faith transcends culture, ethnicities, and nationalities. Okay. When you learn the faith language, communing with the Holy Spirit will be simple.
Okay. Megan. Good evening. So I just kind of wanted to piggyback on uh, the conversation about language. And of course, I think about as we so often hear, you know, as it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit and so it is in the spirit, so it is a natural. And so, of course, you know, as a baby grows up um, into adolescence and a teenagehood, you know, um, they don't come out having, you know, proper English, just using English for nationality purposes, because we talk English, but they don't just have their native language, you know, they develop it over time. And of course, they're also, um, they're also conditioned to speak what they hear. So if they're not taught, then jibber jabber will be their norm. And so as they consistently listen to other people speaking the native language, they begin, of course, to adapt to the language and that's what they speak. So, so it is in the spirit. Um, and while we may understand that the language of speaking the kingdom of God is speaking by faith, first of all, it's about establishing the first, and, and we're going back to what uh, Pastor Merville said, um, first of all, knowing who you are and whose you are in the kingdom that faith is irrelevant if you don't know your identity. So there's nothing that you really can, um, it's nothing that you really even can put in challenge with yourself concerning to see something better about yourself if you first of all don't know who you are. And then that comes in of what, yes? Know who you are where, in God? <laughs> knowing who you are in God and then knowing Who's you are as far as what your purpose is. In God, the, correct? Yes, in God. So before you get saved, you need faith to believe, right? So faith is always the root of everything, even before you learn who you are. So your relationship doesn't start without faith. Right. So it is the language that you learn first. Did I say something different? No, but you you were kind it sounded like you were kind of coming against the language of faith. Before um, we learn faith, walking as a child, before we learn faith, we gotta know who we are. In order for us to know who we are, we gotta have faith first, right? It, yeah. All right, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm fin finish listening. I just I wanted clarity. Go ahead. Okay. So well as in the same thing of before you become saved, you must have faith. It's still, well, my point in saying all of that is, is that there still is a witness factor. Um, in, in saying all of that, the, the, there's still a witness. So before we, we don't just come into knowing, we see, we witness somebody, whether it's somebody else's experience, or we hear somebody else's testimony, or hear somebody else's experience, whatever it is, it still brings us to a point where we learn how we witness based upon somebody else's experience that gives us hope. Mm -hmm. And and that was what um, my my point is in understanding even the language. As you establish that relationship, as you build yourself around the environment that you have, the type of people that you surround yourself with. If if everybody around you is talking one language, but yet you're 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 talking something else. Um, and I'm speaking in terms of just for to be facetious. If if, you're, if, you're, if your language is all straight positivity and all you have in your environment is people speaking negatively in your ear, no matter how positive you try to be, that is going to start influencing what you believe. You'll start looking at things from that perspective because those are the things that consistently surround you. So my point in saying that about um, understanding the kingdom language as we're saying in faith, my witness is what, first of all, is being clarified through who I am watching around me. Are the people that stand around me standing in faith or are they walking in fear? And, and based upon my personal relationship and my personal experience, am I going to allow what I see and what other people say and even what other people dictate to be a relationship with God or what they say to, stay, to, stay, to be faith, as the example was used about mimicking tongues? Some people don't know that they really don't have an established relationship, even in, in understanding the Holy Ghost is present in them because everybody got to have a tongue like Juanita Bynum or like, Brian Karn or like these, these people who are so known and because they have a platform and they sound a certain way, you feel that you got to have that same tongue in order for you to have the same Holy Ghost. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's in your own development. So again, you allow your environment to, to kind of start dictating how you're going to respond to God 
when at the end of the day, like, I'm glad you said it, it goes beyond the speaking in tongues. What does the word say about you? What does the word say who you are? What does the word declare concerning your life? So if don't nobody else believe that's standing around you, like, so you're no longer going to be a believer because you establish your relationship based upon how other people weigh theirs. And we're seeing it now more than ever. Everybody's going with the majority. If if most people are in a panic, then most of the church people are in a panic too. And how can we differentiate ourselves? We're talking, we're talking about we understand the language, but yet we're still speaking the same thing as the world in certain things. I got two questions just by that whole dissertation. Question, the whole dissertation. Question number one. Question number one, and this is for everybody. Question number one, what made you give your life to Christ? Was it, was it the result of seeing someone else who was saved? Or was, was there, what made you give your life to Christ? Two people answer that for me. That's my first can, question. Can I answer? Yes. I was born in it. You weren't born saved. Well, no, not in terms of being saved, but to a certain extent in my house. Well, we did have an option, I guess, if we left, but to a certain extension, that's all we knew was church. But I'm not asking about church. I'm asking, when did you give your life to Christ? Because I grew up in a, in a, in a religious home, and, but I wasn't saved. I didn't get saved until I was in my late teens, for real. I was in church, but, but the strong relationship of wanting to please him shifted when I was extra, much older. I danced, I shouted, I was Holy Ghost filled, I spoke in tongues, but my life did not change until I was much older than what I was when I, when I, was, a young, when I was younger. And I went up to the altar because I got scared that I didn't want to go to hell. So my question is, when did you give your life, who, what made you get saved? My question. Was there an example that you saw that drew you to the altar and you wanted to, and you wanted what they had? <clears throat> Was there an evangelist that kept preaching to you about Jesus and giving your life to Christ that made you draw yourself there? Like, what, what was it? For, for me... I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. For me, uh, like I don't, I know who that was that was speaking, young lady. But I, I too grew up in a household where it was religious. But it wasn't until I was taught it was broken down to me, and I had full clarity as to uh, the purpose of all that going to church and the purpose of all and and what I had experienced. I had experienced the Holy Ghost at an early age, but did not understand it. It wasn't until like I was understanding what that was. And I had, and, and the purpose therein that and I said, okay, I want to give my life to Christ. And it was also examples that I saw around me of people who walked by faith. They truly walked by their faith. So I had examples in front of me of why right. I should. It's real witnesses. Real witnesses. All yeah. right. That's, that's my question because that's, uh, that's Megan good. made a good point. She made a good point about, because we think that the Holy Spirit and Elder Vina, if you want to a- um, answer some more, I'll let you answer. But we made a point, we made it, we made it as if the Holy Spirit is just about speaking in tongues. When the scripture says, after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power, not power to lay hands on the sick and recover, but power to be witnesses unto all the world throughout Judea, which means our whole purpose for being filled is not to speak in tongues. Those are the benefits of it. Our purpose of being filled with the Holy Ghost, glory to God, I feel him. Our whole purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be witnesses. And the reason why I went to the altar had nothing to do with the reason what, why my life changed is because I saw people model being a witness. I didn't see people going to the club when they left the church. Mm-hmm. I didn't see people doing what they wanted to do. I saw people really living a life that was pleasing unto the Lord, and their life wasn't boring, number one. It wasn't boring. They had balance. Mm -hmm. I want want to say this. 
They had balance, but they were saved and mm-hmm. they were witnesses. And I said, oh, well, you can be, you, you, you can be saved and, and you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and, and, and not be extra deep. If that so means. Alice also has a comment. Okay. okay. Elder Renee. Okay. My, when I said that, um, I agree. My thing was, I saw it before I, to a certain good. extent, before I was even taught about it to a certain extent, before I was, um, even I saw it, I saw it at home. And it wasn't that my parents spoke in tongues. That was not them. Um, I saw my mom speak maybe maybe once or twice, and I was like, whoa. But her level of faith and how she treated people and how she conducted herself and how my father treated her and then how we was treated and then how we saw the bishop in them who actually you know my pastor at the time bishop jt Bourne, and we saw i saw their lifestyle and then i saw when i would go to school or different things i would see other things and i to me it was like wow i really want what they have and it was not like you had to be beat over the head or something and it was just a conscious decision for me i rather have what they have than like act or look like y'all that was my thing in terms of me receiving the Holy Ghost, Evangelist Shirley Graham from New Jersey was preaching on it um, at one of our churches, Mount Zion, years and years ago. And I got to the point, it was like, and I knew about the tarrying and stuff like close that. The door, please. But um, at the same No, time, I said close the door. But at the same time, my thing was when I got it, I was like, okay, God, I saw him filling everybody else up. And when I went to church that Sunday morning, I was like, either you're going to give it to me now or I don't want it at all. Because I was taught that was a keeper. And I knew I wanted to be kept. I wasn't exposed to a lot of stuff, thank the Lord. But at the same time, there was such conviction that I wanted to be kept. So that was my purpose of receiving salvation and then my purpose of really wanting the Holy Ghost. Well, I, um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I um, grew up in, 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 a, in a safe family um, of pastors, bishops, evangelists, but it didn't happen to me until uh, uh, at the age between 12 and 13, I had an encounter with God personally. Uh, he came to me in a dream and a vision and he began to speak to me as a young child and he said to me I'll never forget he said Alice love thou me and I would say yes Lord I love thee he said serve me he said Alice love that me I say yes Lord you know I love thee he said feed my sheep at that time I didn't know what he was talking about but as I grew in ministry, then I understood what the Lord says. But it didn't happen to me until at that time. And I was raised around uh, uh, people who truly loved God uh, under uh, Dr. Teresa Garrison, a free evangelist of church. They loved God. And I said, God, I want this. It would not happen until uh, uh, Friday night when I went to church on a Friday night. And we was, you know, the shout was going forth, was praising God, but all of a sudden something picked me up. And when it picked me up, I was slain under the anointing of God. When I came up, I came up speaking in tongues at an early age. So that was my encounter and my love for God. I loved him so much because I saw so many signs and wonders at that time. But like I said, he came to me in a dream and he began to speak to me in a dream. Amen. With that, Bishop, then can I ask this? Because my thing was, growing up, you see different things, you hear different things. And I guess because of the holiness church that I grew up in, and I I love what Pastor Alice just said, because when I, it's like when you have encounters, and the Lord dealt with me concerning things when I was younger, I went to somebody to talk to, and they looked at, they told my mother, you need to have her checked out. She probably needs to be committed. The Lord don't use young people like that. 
And I literally, besides that and other experiences, I'm like, you know, especially encounters with other leadership. And I guess when they see gifts and don't understand them or they see the gifts in you or they're jealous. And that by that time, I, I hate to say it, but as I got older, I'm like, you know what? I still love them. But when it comes to certain things, I'm like, you know what? Forget it. Yeah, I don't want us to get stuck here because it's 930 and we, we're trying to be on a, a, what's the name? But um, when we get into the uh, Pentecost version of the filling of the Holy Spirit, we'll, um, we'll deal with that elder name. But I was filled with the Holy Ghost in a Baptist church, too. Um, I was not filled in, um, with the Holy Ghost in a Pentecostal church. Um, I was filled in a Baptist church that did not believe and speaking in tongues. Um, so you can imagine what I went through as a young person um, in those days. Um, we're getting ready to go. Um, so, can I say something with what you just said? Yes. And you'd be surprised, even in the Holiness Church, the apostolic churches basically taught on the Holy Ghost and stuff like that. The Holiness Churches really didn't teach on it. Yeah. Yeah, we're going, we're going to get into that as our teachers are released. Uh, but, Elder Mervo, you got anything else before we just um, have last remark? Because the saints are logging off and we ain't finished <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm going to close with this. Whatever your kingdom, your culture, as you transition from wanting to be to becoming is revealed by your actions, your speech, and your surroundings. The higher you go in Christ, a lot of things are going to shed off. Holy Spirit will burn things away from you that you no longer need. Holy Spirit will take you to places where he changes the appetite that you have for certain things. God needed God needed a visible kingdom So he invaded the earth so that we can become little gods in, on the earth. He has given us the, the dominion. He has given us Holy Spirit as our governor to teach us how to maintain, keep, rule, and lead other people to the kingdom not only by our words, but by our act, but by our action. Amen. Holy Spirit is our governor. And if you look at him as a person and not just a thing, then you'll be able to see him differently. Because as we said in the beginning, many people don't recognize him as God, as a person, as part of, and they don't understand that he is. And we need to become. Amen. Amen. Good job. I really enjoyed it. Hand claps. Thank you. To God be the glory. Amen. We are getting ready to close. Um, we appreciate um, um, this teaching tonight. I look horrible. Um, Y'all pray for me. Um, <laughs> um, but um, we appreciate this teaching on Holy Spirit tonight. As we move further in this discussion and this teaching, I believe that most of the questions that we have, even as list, listening to each teacher, I believe that they'll be answered. So let's continue to um, 
gather. And my suggestion to you is be, start reading the book of Acts. We are in Pentecost season. Um, start reading the book of Acts, the works of the whole, um, the Acts of the Apostles that really enlighten us regarding the works of the Holy Spirit, um, um, the um, embodiment of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and you'll get a, a really good understanding of the Holy Spirit. I appreciate you all tonight. Um, let's sow tonight. It is our Tuesday night Bible study. Um, let's sow a $17 seed tonight. Um, that's my request tonight as we sow. Let's sow a $17 seed um, to CCOPI's Cash App. Amen. Um, by way of announcements, I do meet with our ministry heads this Friday. Um, via our zoom call so if if you are headed heading a ministry in our ministry in our church i'm going to ask if you would gather on here same time on friday at 8 p.m please excuse my lateness i had slipped off to sleep yay <laughs> i have slipped off to sleep and uh was kind of in dreamland because i haven't slept so um you needed rest, it the rest was kind of really good to me and y'all almost missed me tonight um, but thank god for a wake-up call amen um what else do i have any other announcements elder leslie no that's it bishop all right mother's day is coming up um we will um we won't be assembled in church but i am uh, we are trying to strategize on what we can still do for our mothers because we you all are really appreciated and some of you, uh, all of you mean a lot to me, amen? Um, even those of you that are much older than me that I take as mother figures, um, I want to make sure that we do something for you. So if I pop up at your place of residence, um, uh, something like that for you, um, yeah, just know that I'm going to, um, that we're, we're thinking and brainstorming about something that we can do for you guys. Um, just to bring a smile to your face in the midst of this pandemic, amen. Stay safe. Um, stay in your homes. If you have to go to work, go to work and come back to your house um, and all of that good stuff, all right? Um, I see you guys sewing. Thank you for sewing um, to keep the ministry afloat um, so that when we return, we won't be um, trying to pull in anything, amen. Uh, Mother Woods, it's good to see you. I see your face with your head covered up. Here That's, come right. That's right. Yes, I see. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We're gonna we're go, we're gonna close. Father, we thank you tonight, and we bless you for another opportunity that you've allowed us to come together. Amen. Just to learn and to receive teaching, we give you praise for your Holy Spirit that we're learning even more about that you have feelings and that you can feel and that you speak directly to us. And for that, we are grateful tonight. Hallelujah for that vehicle that we have. Hallelujah. Now, Father, I ask even as we move further in this teaching and further in our relationship that we understand, hallelujah, who you are in our lives and that we would hear you, that, that we would hear you in the still small voice, that it doesn't take you screaming or you yelling, but Father, you speak in the midst of quiet places. We appreciate you, Father. We thank you, Father for your loving kindness is better than life towards us. Father, we even pray tonight, hallelujah, for those that may be battling sickness. We ask that you would heal their bodies. We pray for those that are in the midst of grieving. We pray for the Gillises. We pray for the church at large. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would continue to comfort us. We pray in the name of Jesus for Tracy and we pray for Ashley and we pray for Elder Burgess and Overseer as we see your hand at work in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for Mother Woods tonight. We undergird her and we cover her. Hallelujah. We call all of our elders and our deacons out and we ask that you would continue to preserve us. We thank you tonight because we believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. And your report is no less. Now, Father, as we leave, hallelujah, this line, but never from your presence, I pray that you would give us an experience. Hallelujah. Even with the Holy Spirit, give us an experience that we may testify about in the mighty name of Jesus. Give us a supernatural encounter with you that will change our lives forever. We love you, and most of all, we bless you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Oh, Bishop, Bishop. Yes. Um, just a, another um, announcement. Remember, those of you who are participating in the School of Prophets, make sure that you register. Yes. And um, please sow your $25 seed for the class. It is on online class. Amen. All right. Love y'all. Peace out. Love you too.